Man, K, K is excellent. Thank you. Chapter 21, The Superstars Comeback. Part 2 of the Superstar Saga, here we go. The idea is that Johnny is trying to put his new Mortal Kombat movie into production, but things keep getting in the way, like dying for instance. Then it gets made without him, and he struggles with seeing how his vision has been ruined. Probably works as an allegory for something. And yes, Johnny's fictionalised version of events is based on the original story for MK1, as revealed by notes released online by John Tobias. Chapter 22, The Shadow and the Ambassador. Tanya really is the missing piece in Melina's story, being the first non-Tarkatan to truly accept her and possibly love her, in spite of her perceived ugliness. Of course Baraka would accept her, being Tarkatan and all, but for a non-Tarkatan to do the same is a big deal for Melina, and that's what I wanted to convey in the chapters that centre on their relationship. This one also explains the change in Melina's face in MKX, despite being open to take place in either timeline. Chapter 23, The Cryomancer's Failure. Frost could have been so much more if they'd aspired for more than Robot Girl Virgil. This one depicts Frost's backstory and recruitment into the Lin Kuei, continuing into her role in Deadly Alliance and the beginning of her descent. We also get the first meeting between Scorpion and Sub-Zero since their brutal clash in MK4, which is depicted in a later chapter. Chapter 24, The Fanatic's Downfall. This one's based on a comment someone made on one video, but I forget who or where it was. Basically, Shao Kahn sets Reiko up as his body double for his meeting with the Deadly Alliance. And I flesh out his ties to both Khan and the Brotherhood, since the games never really did. Chapter 25, The Bomber's Plight. What if Sub-Zero met with Cyrax ever again after his restoration by the Special Forces? Good question, me. Allow me to answer with a short story where that exact thing happens. Cyrax tells Sub-Zero where Sector is so that he can play at least a small part in the Lin Kuei's reformation. Chapter 26, The Royal Reunion. Based on the title, you may have guessed that this is another story about the Edenian royal family. And you'd be right. This one is their story in MK3, detailing Katana's detainment by the Black Dragon after she attempts to save Sindel alone, following a disagreement with Sonya and Jax's plan to end things quickly by killing Sindel. From there, the two monks arrive to help out and they, Katana and Jade, have to save Sindel and Edenia from Khan's clutches. Chapter 27, The Emperor's Daughter. Despite not having her title in the title, this is another Melina-centric piece. Taking place during Melina's brief reign as Empress between Deception and Armageddon, we witness Melina's response to Shao Kahn's return and how this affects her relationship with Tanya, setting the stage for... Chapter 28, The Shadows Resolve. After their falling out, Melina realises just how much Tanya means to her and begins taking steps to secure their future together and proving how serious she is about Tanya with an unexpected action in the Forces of Darkness camp before the climactic battle in Edenia. Chapter 29 the Shade and the Protégé. Admittedly, Shadow would probably have been a better title for Noob than Melina, but sometimes we have to live with our own short-sightedness and not just sweep Cyber Sub-Zero under the rug with a hand-waving one pre-fight intro. This one depicts the first meeting of Frost and Bi-Han after Taven helps Kwai Liang fight off Noob Smoke's attack on the Lin Kuei. Bi-Han knows a lot more about Frost's past than even she does, dropping a few truth bombs on her before he plots his escape from the temple. Chapter 30, The Runaway's Quest. For Chapter 30, I wanted to do something special. As such, I used the opportunity to do something based less on the canon and explore a more original premise. In this case, we follow Liu Kang's missing brother, Liu Chao, as the Fire God recruits him to assist in travelling to Shang Tsung's island to eliminate a Kaitin hive to protect Earthrealm. While there, we're also introduced to my alternate take on Collector that makes his absence up to now make more sense. That one's going to be covered on Wasted Potential as well. We then receive answers to another long-standing question about the MK canon that people forgot how haven't been answered yet. You can be damn sure I'll be addressing that on Misconceptions in the future. I'd like to close off by discussing my approach to characterising Frost here. You might ask why I'm not placing this in the chapter discussions, and that's because it would feel weird to have so much more to say about this one chapter than all the rest. The way I approached Frost here was something that I think a lot of people can probably relate to. Frost is Sub-Zero's apprentice. He's had over a decade of experience with his powers, while Frost has had far less, so he's much more proficient and successful than she is. She can't even free someone without killing them, which is how she lost her parents. Couple that with his power amplifying amulet, and Frost feels like a complete failure when compared to him. She develops a massive inferiority complex that only grows the more time she spends around him. And then he takes her with him to Outworld to fight alongside other legendary warriors, and she feels totally out of her depth. This drives her further into the desperation that brings her to this point, where she's stealing the medallion from Sub Zero and then into her unhinged neuroses that convince her that her mentor is intentionally holding her back. This is something I've gone through as a YouTuber, though not nearly to that extreme an extent. 
I used to be in the Discord server of one Mr. Clemps. Clemps had been around a while, but he was just starting to blow up around this time. It was a server I spent the most time on where a discussion of Clemps' content was very common. By this point, I'd been on YouTube for around a decade and Clemps just rocketed past me in viewership. And seeing him hit so many milestones and such, it left me thinking that a guy who's been around as long as I have realistically should have a viewership well above someone as relatively new as him, so what the hell am I doing wrong? Why is my content not as good as his? I was constantly being dragged down by my own comparisons between myself and him. Eventually, I left the server and disconnected myself from Clemps and his content. And I have to be clear, Clemps did nothing wrong here. He deserves all the success he's earned 100%, but distancing myself from him and his work really helped to improve my general mood because I wasn't constantly comparing myself to him and his success anymore. And so, I can relate to the inferiority complex that Frost can and should be written with. And I'm sure a lot of other people can too. Be it in their hobbies, careers, or even families, I'm sure many people compare themselves very negatively to someone else and it just eats away at them and leaves them entrenched in a really dark mood. It's a destructive mindset that a lot of people can easily fall into and I think that if Frost had been written with that kind of mindset in mind, rather than a generic lust for power, people would view her a lot more favourably than they do her robot girl Virgil persona. Where's your motivation? If you liked this video, why not subscribe and support me on Patreon like these fine people here? If not, then make sure to share it with your enemies so they can suffer along with you. Today's recommended content is the Mortal Kombat Encyclopedia by Uppercut Editions. It's a fan-made encyclopedia that's in the process of being updated post-aftermath that intends to be a physical MK Bible that explains all the characters and stages and such. Facebook and Twitter links are in the description. Minor characters. Your guest characters. Uh, arenas. Uh, comic books. Um, and then you have the upper cut edition.